everybody, it's Pastor Tavner. I just want to take a second and say thank you so much for tuning in to Venue Church right here online. Welcome. You are part of the family. And I'm so excited that we're literally getting to build God's kingdom and change the world together. Hey, if you tuned in, just take a second before you move forward with the video and like it, comment, subscribe to our YouTube page, and turn on all your alerts because you don't want to miss everything that God's doing through us, me and you together at Venue Church. A couple more things. I just wanted to remind you that something as easy as sharing this link can really help someone. So if you know somebody going through some things, they need a little bit of God in their life, we say it like this around Venue. Just share the link, and when you do, you share the love. I'm telling you, it can change somebody with one simple click on your phone. And if you'd love to give to the ministry, there's some easy ways that we're going to put on the screen because your finances are helping us make a difference, not just here in Chattanooga, but all over the world. Hey, God's doing something special through this house, and I'm excited for you to hear the word that he's got today. So listen, sit up straight, lean in, get your notepad ready, enjoy the word. I'll see you soon. I love you. Well, what's up, Venue Church? How are y'all doing this morning? I'm so glad that you're here. So glad that you're here. Would you do me a favor? Just tap the person next to you. Tell them you're so glad you get to do church with them this morning. I don't want you to forget that. Like, it's not about just coming to hear me preach. My messages will challenge you. They're not going to change you. Community is what's going to change you. Doing life together is what's going to change you. Getting involved with each other. And iron sharpens iron. And hanging out with each other. And being able to be real with each other. And having a friend you can be vulnerable with. And you don't have to hide your mess anymore. Because guess what? Everybody in here has got mess. Including me. Everybody in here has got mess. And you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. And if you get in a community like that, we got small groups you can sign up for. We got volunteer teams you can get around people. We got so many ways that you can get involved. And it's not just about doing things. Do you know why we do things? Do you know why we create those opportunities? So people can get around people. You can meet your next best friend. You can meet maybe your future spouse. You never know. You can meet somebody that you just relate to and hang out with and, and can talk to about everything. Like, I want to invite you to get involved in community. Don't just show up every single week and sit back and listen to me talk. I'm going to talk every week. I got a big mouth. I'm going to come prepared with a message every single week. But let's go bigger than that. It isn't about watching what's happening on the stage. This is just an opportunity to create an atmosphere to worship. It's about what happens off this stage. In y'all's life with each other, they'll really change you on a deep level. I just want to continue to encourage you to get involved in community. So. Can I pray with us? Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing in our life. I'm so excited about spending time with the greatest people in the world today. God, push us, challenge us, change us. Pray we walk out of here different. We love you. Would you just say to yourself, you don't have to say it out loud, but even just say to yourself, God, my heart's open. I'm in week two of what we call seasons. We used to call them series, and we would try to start them at the beginning of every month, but I realized people don't live their life in series. People live their life in seasons. Uh, 
what's going on in our life doesn't start over the first Sunday of every month. And I realized we were changing topics based on the dates when sometimes the things in our life didn't change like that and we needed to stay on something a little bit longer. So what I really felt like was we were supposed to start having seasons. And however long we're in it, we're in it until the Lord releases us and said he's changed some things and people need something different. Because I love to pray this here at Venue Church. Not God give me a good message, but God, what do the people of Venue need to hear this week? What is it that we need? They're hungry, they're thirsty, they're needing something. What exactly is it? I'm praying that the Lord is watching in your window, in your living room, in your life, and then reporting back to me when I'm praying. Not everything that you're doing, but just saying, hey, this is the needs that everybody has, and here's what we need to talk about. And so we're in this season called The Assignment. And last week I opened up the whole season giving you the story about me and my friend talking and how he shared about being in college and and he was failing his class, and this one assignment could bring him through, and he gave it all. I mean, he didn't go out that weekend, he didn't do nothing, he just gave it all to this assignment. Turned it in and thought he was going to get an A+, plus only to get his paper back that had a big F on it. And he couldn't figure it out, but he read the notes and said, great content, great research, great format, wrong assignment. Because what we talked about last week is how you can be successful at something you were never called to. And what we decided was that our assignment is not our career. Our career is great. I hope you are thriving. If you're in real estate, I hope you're selling and selling and selling. I hope you're banking that money and God's blessing you. If you're in nursing, I hope you are getting fulfilled out of all the amazing things you are doing to help people right there in their need. Whatever it is that you're doing, I hope that it brings you joy and you look forward to getting up every day to go do it. But it's not what you're here for. That's an extra opportunity to take the overflow of what you're here for into another place called the marketplace and let more people see Jesus on you. But the real assignment, the real reason we were born is to make Jesus' name famous by building his church and bringing heaven down to earth with our life. That's our assignment. That's our assignment. And we want to talk about that and I want to dig a little bit deeper into that. And as I was thinking this week, about what we were going to talk about, I wanted to share this experience I've had the last couple weeks in my life with this smoke detector at my house. Because uh, I'm renting a house right now, and y'all, I told you a story, I'm trying to buy it, and God's working out some really cool ways with that, but I, I was laying on the couch the other night, it was late, I mean, it's one in the morning because your boy up here can't sleep at all, I can't get to sleep, and so I'm sitting there scrolling through Netflix, trying to find something I haven't watched yet to get me to go to sleep, and I'm laying on the couch, and, and I'm about to fall asleep, and then I hear this. Ready? Beep. I'm like, all right. Maybe this will go away. I don't know if this ever happened to you all before. About five minutes later, beep. Another couple minutes, beep. Another couple minutes, beep. Well, I look around, and I'm renting the house, so I have this little security panel from, I guess, the person that lived there before had a security system. And the power had gone off from one of the storms that we had. And I thought, maybe it just tripped that. So it's 1.30 in the morning. I'm over there with a screwdriver trying to take it apart. I couldn't figure it out. So finally, I called my landlord. And I said, could you have somebody come disconnect this? They came over, disconnected the whole panel. And it stopped for a minute, and he left. And how come everything stops until they leave? Am I the only one? Your car is making a noise. As soon as you take it and they drive it, they're like, I didn't hear anything. Two miles down the road, click clonk, click clonk, click clonk. Like, here we go. The beeping stop. He drives out. He's gone five minutes. I'm walking through the kitchen. Beep. A day later. Beep. Two days later. Beep. A week later. Beep. I couldn't sleep for like six nights because of this beeping. So finally, I called the landlord. I'm like, I found out it's not the thing. It's a smoke detector up by the top of the roof. It's too high. I don't have a ladder to get it. My landlord's awesome, but she's real. She's amazing. She was like, smoke detectors are not our issue. <laughs> I was like, but I don't have a ladder. Find somebody that has a ladder. Hmm. She's nice. She's awesome. She was correct. So I found somebody that had a ladder. I climbed up there. I changed the battery. And praise Jesus. No more beeping. 
Do you know why I said that? I said because I found something. I said that because I found something out. Since I rent my house, the people that I rent it from do not hop in my business and take care of all my day-to-day -day affairs for me. They have said to me, since you've signed a lease, we now give you authority to manage this property. We own it, but you manage it. So now there are certain things, since you signed your name on this, that are your responsibility, and unless you do them, they won't get done. I'm preaching in here, and y'all still think I'm talking about my house and smoke detectors. What I'm really doing is I'm preaching about the kingdom. This is how our life works. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns the earth, but he's leased it out to me and you. And he said, now I have given you the authority to rule and have dominion and bring heaven down to earth. So you can come to me and my presence and my spirit will visit you, but I'm not going to come do everything for you. I'm going to empower you to manage the area that I've given you to manage. It's really what I want to talk about today as we jump into the next level of our assignment. Because building God's house happens inside these walls and outside of these walls. Building God's house happens with what we do in here, but we also, all of us, have a dominion, an authority, a territory that God has put us in, that he's given us lease over, that we are to manage what happens there. It's your job. It's your neighborhood. It's where you shop. It's your family. It's all of these things that you are tied to. And a lot of times we got a lot of beep going on. And it's our responsibility, are you with me, to dive in and do something about it. I, I was thinking about this thought, and the Lord reminded me of a passage of Scripture that, that I think in church we throw it around a lot. Uh, but but, but can, can I just take you there real quick? It's Mark chapter 4. It's Jesus, and he's telling a story. He says this. He said, listen, the farmer went out to plant some seed, and he scattered it across his field. And some fell on the footpath, and... The birds came and ate it. And others fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. And the seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun. And since it didn't have deep roots, it died. And other seed fell among the thorns and it grew up and it choked out the tender plants. So they produced no grain. Still others fell on fertile, fertile soil and they sprouted. They grew and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. So they're like cool, God, but we don't get all of this. And Jesus said, verse 13, this is a parable, and if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, which a parable was like an earthly story to teach them a kingdom principle. That's basically what a parable was. He said, if you can't understand this, then how will you understand all the other parables that I tell? The farmer plants the seed, so here's what I'm saying when I was given this story. I'm trying to tell you that the seed is taking God's word to others. Now, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. Like, it just fell on top of the soil and didn't get in at all, and it was scooped away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message, and they immediately receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. So as long as they're in the room and the emotion is going, they're good, but when they get home and times get hard, they're back to whatever else numbed them. I'm preaching already. They fall away soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of the life, the lure of wealth, the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on the good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word. And they produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as the seed has been planted. So he's telling them the story, and he's like, hey, let me categorize 100% of people in the world. Here's who they are. 25% of them, the word just falls on hard soil, and it doesn't even get into their heart. 
And if a seed can't get under the ground, it can't take root and no change can happen. Let me tell you, another 25% of them, man, they got some other stuff down in their heart. It's hot, ro rocky, and it's hard, and there's not much room for any roots to grow. So they're going to have moments, but they're not going to last. Then there's these other people, man, like, like you're going to think that they, they, they want it, but they got so many other things in the world, it just drowns out everything trying to happen in life. But then you got 25%, they're good to go. As soon as they walk in, they're crying. They're at the altar every week. They want everything Jesus has for them. That's all the people right there. And it's cool to understand that, but, 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 but it confuses us a little bit, I think, because I think we've all fallen under the religious spell that this parable means only 25% of people can be reached. Because that's what I was told. I remember this preacher. I thought he was really wise. He, he told me this one time. He's like, hey, because I, I, I said, man, we did all this. We marked it. We did all this. And all these people came. And, and, and not even that many came back afterwards. He was like, well, Jesus said only 25% were going to respond. So your return's 30%. You're 5% better than Jesus. Don't expect any more than 25% because only 25% are really ever going to respond. That's pretty much the standard Jesus said. And I bought into that. And so anything over 25%, I was like, man, that's a win until God convicted me and said, you're telling me, Tavner, that me, the same guy that wrote this, it's my will that none should perish, but all should come to the presence of God. Me, that guy has created a system to where only 25% of people can get it? God reminded him, God said, hey, Tavner, what if I'm not saying only 25% can get it? So just bank on that. What if I'm saying focus on working the ground of the 75% who aren't there yet? That's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to preach you a message that I thought and I titled Groundwork. Groundwork. Because as soon as I was reading about these different seeds in the soil, God took me to another story in the Old Testament. Do you mind if I read it for you? I'm going to read a lot of scripture today, but I thought that would be kind of cool since we were at church and everything. Are you all right with that? <laughs> this is 2 Kings chapter 3, right? We got all the soil happening. 75% is either hard, thorny, rocky, all the kinds of stuff. 25% is good, but like... We want all 100%, right? It's our assignment. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I found this story. It says, Joram, son of Ahab, began his rule over Israel and Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he was the king for 12 years. And in God's sight, he was a bad king, but he wasn't as bad as his father and his mother. You know who his father and his mother was? Ahab and Jezebel. To his credit, he destroyed the obscene Baal stone that his father had made. They worshipped Baal. But he hung on to the sinful practices of Jeroboam, son of Naboth. The ones that had corrupted Israel for so long. And he wasn't about to give them up, probably because they made him money. Now, King Mesha of Moab raised sheep. And when he had to deal with Ahab, he was forced to give the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and another 100,000 rams. So when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled. So he's like, Ahab's dead. That deal's done. I ain't giving you 200,000 things anymore. So King Joram got mad. And he set out from Samaria, and he prepared Israel for war. And his first move was to send a message to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Would you join me and fight him? I'm with you all the way, said Jehoshaphat. My troops are your troops. My horses are your horses. Which route shall we take? Through the bad lands of Edom. So the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of Eden, Eden started out on what proved to be a looping detour. I like that because sometimes that seems like it describes our life. It seems like we were going point A to B, but somehow God took us on a looping detour. We didn't, y'all ever, uh, you ever missed your exit on 285 in Atlanta? You don't want to do that. It's 25 minutes with no traffic to get back to that exit. Doesn't life feel that way sometimes? It's like we didn't, we ain't there yet and we feel like we just looping. <laughs> Here we go again. Now, after seven days, they ran out of water for both army and animal. The king of Israel said, bad news, God's gotten us, the three kings out here, to dump us in the hand of Moab. Isn't that funny how when things start going wrong in our life, we always like to point our finger at God. Hmm. 
But Jehoshaphat said, isn't there a prophet of God anywhere around through whom we can consult? One of the servants of the king said, Elisha, the son of Prephet, is around somewhere. The one who was Elijah's right-hand man. And Jehoshaphat said, good, a man we can trust. So the three of them, the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat and the king of Eden, went to meet him. And Elisha addressed the king of Israel. And he said this, what do you and I have in common? Why don't you go consult the puppet prophets of your father and your mother? Never, said the king of Israel. It's God who's gotten us into this fix, dumping all three of us kings into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, as God of the angel armies live, before whom I stand ready to serve, if it weren't for the respect I have for Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I wouldn't give you the time of day. In other words, the only reason I'm talking to you is because I respect him. I love that the Bible preaches without me preaching. You know what this is, right? This is a shadow. This is, this is God saying, you know what? You, y'all are sinners and you aren't worthy of everything. But the reason I'm coming to you is because you're represented by my son, Jesus. And since he stood there in your place and took everything for you, I don't even see you in your mess anymore. I see you in your mess filtered through the blood of my relationship with him. Who's thankful for Jesus and his blood in your life and everything that he's done? I'm so grateful for that. But considering, bring me a minstrel. Bring me a musician. When the musician played, the power of God came on Elisha. And he said, here's God's word. Dig ditches all over this valley. And here's what will happen. You won't hear the wind. You won't see the rain. This valley is going to fill up with water. And your army and your animals will drink their fill. This is easy for God to do. I just felt like the Lord told me to tell you, whatever you're believing right now, it's easy for God to do. He will also hand over Moab to you, and you will ravage the country. Not only is he going to give you water, he's going to give you the victory. So, Father, take your word and bless it in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody said amen. Amen. We're living on assignment. To manage the territory that God has put us in charge of. The problem is, as we look at the relationships that are in our life, most of them are filled, hopefully, with a lot of people who need Jesus. And I think what we believe in our heart sometimes is that our assignment is to make sure that us and ours are okay. And we forget that our assignment is to build God's house, not just inside the walls, but build God's house and bring heaven to earth and make his name famous in the territory that he gave us. Which means, as I said earlier, that as the stuff is beeping in our life, It's not that we just call to God and get out of the way and he shows up. But as we call to God, he visits us and gives us the plan and how to move forward to reach the people that he put in our lives. So they're doing the same thing here. They're showing up. They're going to war. They're tired. They're thirsty. They're out of water. They're going the the roundabout way. And when they get there... They're frustrated, complaining, and telling God, it's your fault. You've done this. What do we do? The prophet shows up and said, here's what you got to do. You want want water? You want to defeat the enemy? Grab something and dig some ditches. It's really what I felt like the Lord told me to tell us today. That we've been praying for these people in our life. That we've been believing for these people in our life. That we have all of these people in our life that fall into the first category. Most of them have rocky hearts, shallow hearts, hard hearts, thorny hearts, all of these things. What are we going to do? I felt like the Lord told me to tell us it's time to start digging some ditches. It's time for us to quit hoping that one day they'll just come around and start knowing that our assignment is that we have something God's given in us that we can till the soil just a little bit to take the hard surface off of what we see in them and make a place where the water and the presence of God can fill their life and change them forever. We can dig some ditches 
And we can see God do miracles. It's the assignment on our life for the people that we are assigned to. And I really thought, all right, Lord, let's preach that. Because I can preach this. Matter of fact, I can get on this digging ditches thing, and I can get him on an organ sound, and I can stomp and run some laps, and I can raise my voice and say a couple church phrases that'll get you fired up in about 15 minutes. We can all be tossing babies, ripping our wigs off, running around this thing, throwing chairs, chest bumping each other, high-fiving and getting on the internet saying, that was the greatest service ever. They'll even have a picture of me with a shovel like I'm digging something. But the danger is, what if I can get us all fired up about digging ditches and we get excited about it, but we don't even know how to dig when we leave? We don't know what we're digging with. And I felt like I'm supposed to fill in those gaps today. Because obviously, somebody dug some ditches for you. You can't tell me that you were always soft-hearted, good soil, seed taking root. Don't play me. Don't tell me you hadn't ever yelled and been bitter at God before. Don't tell me you didn't have that rocky soil at one time. Don't tell me you didn't weren't drowned out by the cares of the world at one time. Don't tell me you didn't have some rough soil. Don't tell me that every one of us in here wasn't a part of that other 75%. And thank God for somebody who took whatever God gave them in their hand and started digging a little bit in our life. And now look at us. We're sitting in here wanting the word of God in our life. Have you ever wondered what they did? You may have attributed it to maybe a conversation, but it goes deeper than that. And I really felt like the Lord gave me a couple things through this passage that I want to share. I want to give us the tools to dig some ditches and the people in our lives, hearts, as we walk out of here. Are y'all ready? Will you go with me? Number one, let me tell you what the first thing we can do, the first way we can dig ditches. You ready for this? We reach people. I'm be fine, too confident. I don't need your compliment. Uh -uh. Yeah, bitch, I'm dominant. Trunk busting, got diamonds in it. She talking and she ain't trying it. He keep calling me crime. First thing we can do is pray. I need you to know there is power in prayer. I need you to know prayer can change everything. I need you to know prayer is not meaningless words that we toss up to a ceiling and if our life is in good enough order, maybe God can hear them. But I want you to know that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn in two, which meant you didn't need anybody to represent you before God anymore and his blood covers you. And now the Bible says you can boldly stand in the throne room of God and you can receive his grace over your life. Which means this, every one of you have access to God himself. You're one prayer away from his throne room. There's power in prayer. John Wesley said it this way, nothing on earth takes place outside of praying men and women. There's power in prayer. I'm telling you, conversation can shift things. I'm telling you, that they're... they're, they're opportunities God can create for you to get in front of people, but when you are dripping with the oil of the anointing of God because you have prayed over something, something different happens in that moment. I'm telling you, y'all, I know we give out invitations, and I'm saying invite people all the time, invite people all the time, and you can invite somebody, and it can be an invitation that is a piece of paper that they put in their pocket and they put in their counter, but can you tell you what can also happen? You can pray over that invitation, and you can bless the name of God, and you can, and you can say how what you believe, how God's going to work in people, and speak that over that, and you can spend time praying over that before you give it out, and the oil of the anointing of that prayer can, through that invitation, do something in the hearts of those people that you could never do in your own natural self. I'm telling you, I'm out there inviting. 
I'm going to apartments. I'm going to houses. I'm putting on cars. And do you know what I do? Every time I grab those, those, those invitations, I start praying in the spirit. I start praying in the spirit. Then I get outside of that. And then I start praying in my natural. God, I thank you that the person behind this door of this apartment, whatever they're going through, God, that this is going to be a divine appointment for them to come and get an answer from you. And they're not going to be able to throw it away. But they're going to set it on their counter. And if somebody throws it away, somebody's going to see that piece. It says a sign and say, oh, that's pretty. That's going to end up sitting it over here. And they're going to sit in our building, and God's going to get in their heart, and something's going to change. I'm telling you, statistics say, statistics say that 1% of the people you invite will come. So if you give out 100 invitations, one person will come. If you give out 1,000, 10 people will come. 1%. But can I tell you something? Statistics are dry and don't have the oil and the presence of God on them. But when you get the oil and the presence and the anointing of God on something, it can take what may be fact and turn it into truth. It can take what may be a statistic and turn it into something that God said could happen in his word. I'm telling you, prayer shifts things. Prayer shifts people. Can I tell you, if you're trying to dig up the soil with people and you don't have any prayer going on for them, you're trying to get through the hardness of soil with no point on your shovel. But when you'll submit yourself to prayer and you'll submit yourself to the presence of God, can I tell you what can happen? What can happen is that the sharp point can be put on the end of the shovel that you're trying to dig the, through the hard heart of their soil with. And I'm telling you something, something that for years you were just doing like this and couldn't make any breakthrough, you can set it down like that and it'll slide right through that soil. It's what happens. It's what happened in the story. They're mad. They're mad at God. They think they're going to lose. They're thirsty. They don't know what's going on. And they say, we got to find somebody. Where's he at? Well, we got this guy, Elisha. Go get him. They go get Elisha. And I want you to see what happens. Elisha showed up. And Elisha, without the prayer and presence of God, submitted to the atmosphere that was already created. Did you read the story? The story said this. The story said that they walk out and they're up there complaining. Oh, God did this. God did that. Go get Elisha. Here comes Elisha. And Elisha's like, I don't even want to talk to you. You're this and you're that and you're that. Elisha comes with an attitude. Then all of a sudden, Elisha recognizes there's another man of God that has character. And it reminds him, you don't let the atmosphere control you. You got something in you that can change the atmosphere. So immediately he says this, where's my music man? Give me something to stir up me so I can go where I need to go right now. Because in my natural, I'm mad. In my natural, I'm going to cast insults. In my natural, I'm going to say what I think. In my natural, I'm going to act the way that I think the flesh would act. Give me my music. I got to get in God's presence. Because when I get in God's presence, everything can change. And the guy comes to play the harp, and the music starts playing. And Elisha starts praying. And immediately, everything shifts. Everything shifts. You got three kings who think everybody takes orders from them, who want to do everything they want to do, and who is mad at Elisha. You got Elisha that has an attitude, and he's mad at them. And in one moment, being in God's presence, what happens? Everything shifts. Now Elisha's hearing God's voice. Now when he speaks God's voice, three kings are listening to what God said. Here's what we got to do. Here's what the Lord said. Dig ditches all over this place. They didn't bring shovels. They didn't come to work. They came to fight. You don't hear the kings giving excuses. You don't hear the kings complaining. You don't hear the kings saying, you can't tell me what to do. You don't hear the kings blaming God anymore. Everything changed. They went and mobilized their army and they began to do what God said to do. Why? Because of a moment of prayer. I just feel God's presence in this place because I feel like we have those moments where that 75% of people in our world, we 
been trying to dig through the soil like this. And it feels like we don't have any breakthrough. what could happen if we could just take that moment I don't know if it's a minute I don't know if it's five minutes I don't know if it's on your way to work I don't know if it's before you go to bed I don't know when it is but maybe you set an alarm on your phone but what if we had those names that we have in our head right now and we could set that time and we just created an atmosphere in God in God's presence for them can you imagine what could happen if we just got down for them every single day and we just began to worship and just say Jesus we love you we love you, Jesus. You're holy and you're righteous and you're mighty and you're amazing and you're good and you're strong and you're big and you're powerful and you're gentle and you're kind and you're loving and you're forgiving and you're gracious and you're merciful and you chase us down to the farthest part that we could run. God, your word says that any of us that make our bed in hell, you'll show up and you'll pick us up there, Father. We thank you, God, that you're holy. We thank you, God, that you're big. We thank you, God, that you're lifted up and separated and different. You're the name above every other name. We thank you, God, that the people that we love, that we're praying for, they're struggling. The name of depression has it's gripped them. The name of anxiety and panic has gripped them. The name of hopelessness, the name of joylessness, the name, God, of, of, of defeat, Father, the name of fear. It's all taking a grip on them. They're under the name of anger, God. They're under the name of bitterness, Father. They're under the name of unbelief. But we thank you, God, right now that the Son of God humbled himself and came Came down and became a man and submitted himself to the cross and you spilled your blood and you became the name above every other name and we thank you that every name the name of addiction the name of shame it has to bow to your name we thank you God right now that wherever they are that you arrest their hearts in the name of Jesus we thank you God that even as they laying in their bed on Sunday morning they didn't plan to get up, God. We thank you right now, God, that you wake them up. But you don't wake them up in guilt, Father. You wake them up with expectation. You wake them up and show them vision and purpose for their life. We wake them up and show them something so great, God, that they run after it and leave everything else behind that is trying to hold them down. We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you're awakening dreams on the inside of them. We thank you, God, that you're reminding them of, of dreams you put in their heart when they were a child. And hard things in their life have gotten them off track. Bring them back to those places, God. Let them dream again, God. God, we thank you that you put people in their life every day, outside of us even, that show them the kindness of God. It's not the judgment of God that brings people to repentance. It's the kindness of God that brings people to repentance. God, we pray they feel your love, that you overwhelm them with your love, that even as they're laying in their bed, they feel the weight of your presence, like 20 heavy blankets are on them, but it's comforting, and they feel like they're forgiven and they're wanted, Father. Thank you that the shame of their past disappears, God. I thank you that they feel like they can breathe again. I thank you they feel like that weight is lifted off their chest, Father. We thank you, God, that you take the veil off of their face and the blinders off of their eyes and that they can see who you really are, Father. We thank you the spirit of religion is broken off of them, God. We thank you, God, that the hurt is not on them anymore, Father, that you release the hurt that church has caused them. You release the hurt that Christians have caused them, that, God, you release the hate that's come against them and you let them know there's a place for them in the kingdom of God, Father. It doesn't matter what they're dealing with and what they're struggling with. We, let, we pray that you let them know how much you love them, Father. Show us ways 
Show us ways to reach them. Show us ways to be obedient, God. Give us ideas and opportunities to show them the love of Jesus, Father. If you want us to be quiet, tell us and we'll be quiet. If you want us to pursue them, tell us and we'll pursue them. If you want us to chase them, we'll chase them. If you want us to, to, to just sit back and pray, we'll do it. Speak to us, God. Let us know. I pray, God, right now that everywhere they turn, they'll be arrested by the presence of God. Thank you that as they're shopping in Walmart, they won't be able to help but just tears come down their face because they feel the strong presence of the Holy Spirit, God. Intervene in their life, God. Let them know that you don't just clean up attacks that aren't their fault. You clean up messes that they made, too. We believe in your power, God. I thank you that the spirit of unbelief is bowing to your name. God, I just specifically pray for people who have decided that they're atheists, God, that you would show them that you are real. That you would show them that you can be believed in, God. I pray, God, and I thank you that they're going to have experiences with you, God, that nobody can take away from them. It's one thing to hear Pastor preach, and because he said it, I'll believe it. It's another thing when something happens in their life that they can't explain away, God. That can't be taken away from them. And I pray that supernatural encounters with you would happen, Jesus. I pray for protection over them. Thank you that they're safe, God, until they know you, Father. Thank you that their lives are spared, that they will never die without you, God. You said that it's your will that none should perish. You said that anything according to your will that we ask, you'll do. You said if we know you hear us, we know you'll answer our prayers. So we stand in the gap for those who are in our lives, God, who need you. Bring them to you, Father. Make them hungry for you, Father. Draw them, Holy Spirit. They need you, God. We need you, God. We need your presence, God. things and just pray for the people you're believing for just like I pray right now come on just call their name out if you need to call their name out you can do it God thank you Jesus Thank you that you do something in our life so big it creates curiosity in them. I pray, God, that you break down the spirit of religion that has reigned over this area. The thing that makes everybody think, oh, I can't take that step because I can't be good enough or perfect enough. And I pray, God, that you break down the walls. 
I pray, God, that everybody that's holding that religion up, thanking God that they're prideful and they're perfect in their life, I pray you would expose all their secret places publicly so that there can be no quote-unquote perfect people around so then people can understand church can't be for perfect people because there ain't none. I thank you, God, that you invite people in just like they are. I thank you that they can see you're okay. You're not afraid of them. You're not scared of that mess. You're not afraid of the dirt. We all got it. I pray, God, that you help them take away the fear of judgment. Take away that spirit of judgment in your house, God. And let this be a place of love and a place that's inviting and a place that people want to run to, not run away from, God. Create something authentic. Create something real. Create something transparent. Create something, God, where people feel like they can relate. Create something, God, where people desire to come here and be a part of community and a part of the challenge and the word to move their life forward, God. Strip religion off of this place, God, and help people run after a relationship with you. Shift things, God. May we never be the same. Give us boldness. Give us boldness to do everything you tell us to do. If you wake us up at 2 in the morning and say, go drive and knock on that person's door and give them a hug and tell them how much I love them, let us trust you so much that we know the second we get our arms around them, they're going to break down crying and submit to you right there. It's a seed that's going to bring salvation. Let us be obedient and willing and bold to do anything you call us to do. Shift the soil, God. It's hard for a reason because they've been hurt and they put up walls and they're scared. I pray you take the fear down, God. Soften their hearts so the seed of your word and your love can get on the inside of them, God. The thorns are protections. The rocks are protections. God, let them know they're safe with you. testimony of it. My brother is one of the first guys you'll see in parking out there waving at you. Michael, you know, Michael didn't even believe in God. He didn't want to come to church. I prayed for him for 15 years and the Lord said, invite him on a trip to Israel. And I did. And I felt like the Lord said, fast for 21 days before he goes. Don't eat nothing and just pray for him. For 21 days, I didn't eat anything. I just prayed for him for 21 days. And can I tell you, on that trip, God moved in his heart in such a way and shifted him forever. And he went from being someone who didn't know if he believed in God to now working full time at this church, doing things that help us stay in here every week to get to be able to experience God's presence. There's power in prayer I prayed for my neighbor Mr. Ellison since before I got saved save him Lord change him I prayed for him for almost 30 years last year I went home to visit went back to where, my, where I'm from to visit my sister and I was coming back home and she, she lived in that lives in the house that I, I used to live in and I, I passed Mr. Ellison's house. I felt like the Lord said, stop in. I didn't really want to talk to him, so I knocked on the door. I knew he wouldn't answer real softly and I gave him a minute to come to the door and then I left. I got two miles up the road. The Lord said, turn around and go back. I said, Lord, I got a four hour drive ahead of me. I want to turn around and go back. He said, turn around and go back. I turned around and I went back. I knocked on the door and I waited for him. 
I said, Mr. Ellison, I've been praying for you for 30 years. I lived right there beside you. I worked in your warehouse. You know me since I, before, I, before I was born, he lived right there. And, and I lived there with my whole life. I said, you know me. I, I, I just want to know. I don't know if I'll ever see you again. Do you know that you've been saved and you know Jesus as your Savior? He said, Pat, Tabner, can I tell you something? He said, just about a year ago, I went to a service with someone, and I, they were pre I went down and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Do you know what? I left and I drove home. Two days later, my sister called and said, Mr. Ellison passed away. But do you know what? Now I can stand up here. And I can tell you, I know he's with Jesus. And I didn't get to preach the message, and I wasn't at the church, but I got to plant some seed. I got to work on that soil a little bit from the distance because I was praying for him every single day for 30 years, digging some ditches. And now Mr. Ellison gets to run the streets of heaven because people around his life sharpened the edge of that shovel and went to Jesus for him. I'm telling you, he can do it for everybody in your life. atmosphere and get a hold of God and then you be real and you be you when you're around them Elijah and he called his mantle and it said this, he got a double portion of the anointing. He got double the anointing, double the favor, double the miracles. So I want you to notice something. Is there a man of God around here? There's Elisha. And then you'll read what they said about him. They didn't say there's Elisha, the man with double the miracle. They didn't say there's Elisha, the man with double the anointing. They didn't say there's Elisha, the man with double the favor. They said there's Elisha. He's the one who used to serve Elijah. Another version said there's Elisha. He's the one who used to pour water over Elijah's hands. Listen, when they were looking for the man of God, they didn't look at how many miracles he did. They looked at did he serve. That was his reputation. And after they said it's Elisha, the man who served Elisha, here's what they followed up. They said, that's the man that can be trusted. We'll dig some ditches, you gotta pray. Then we gotta serve. You know the greatest way? speak into someone's life is to humble yourself and serve them. serve our family in our greatest time of need. Jesus was about to go on the cross and serve us in the greatest way possible, give his life. You know what he did? He got down on his knees and said, let me give you the example of a real leader. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to take the form of a servant.
sir. God will send the water. You hear him? He said it ain't going to rain and the wind ain't going to blow. But you're going to wake up in the morning and the whole valley is going to be filled with water. of UTC, God, on the campus of Lee University, of Southern University, of all of these colleges around here, Chat State, and college kids are flooding into this place, God, getting into the presence of God and taking it back to their hometowns when they go back and visit, God. I thank you for families, God. I thank you for everybody on every level, Father, single people, married people, divorced people, everybody, God, that they are getting their fill of you, that they're going out and working the soil and the ground that they are they are called to, God, and that you're doing miracles in all of their lives. And I thank you, God, that revival is breaking out in this city, God. Do it through us. Put us on assignment. We're here. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Here we are. Send us. Come on, say, here I am. Send me. We'll dig, Lord. Jesus' name. Come on, everybody said amen. Come on, can we lift Jesus up in this place? I love y'all so much. I can't wait to see you next week. Welcome Pastor Michael to the stage. Let's go, VU Church.